very good taste in art. Well, thank you. Do you work for a gallery or a private collector? Hello everyone and welcome to Fright Club NI. Uh, my name is Joe McElroy and today I'm very privileged to be joined by three people involved in the making of the fantastic A Wounded Fawn. I'm with uh, co-writer director Travis Stevens and the two stars Sarah Lind and Josh Rubin. So thank you very much guys for uh, taking time out of your schedules to speak with us today. Thank you. Thank you for having us. No, really appreciate it. So, um, okay, so Wounded Fawn itself. I absolutely love this film, you know, uh, first came across it when it was screened at Fright Fest and I went into it knowing absolutely nothing about it, which I tend to try and do more and more these days with films. Uh, I just knew the basic premise, you know, boy meets girl, boy takes girl in a romantic getaway, but ends up boy is a serial killer. That's all I knew going in. And um, by the end of the film, I was completely blown away by it. Um, so basically, first question sort of for yourself, Travis, you know, like I said, it is a very simple enough sort of bare bones sort of uh, plot and background to it. It's, you know, a basic um, cat and mice sort of uh, slasher. But you have, in, you know, you've installed these surrealist elements as well as, you know, the inclusion of Greek goddesses. Where did that sort of come about, you know, when you were in the process of uh, making the film? And sort of why yeah. did you go that route? Sorry. Uh well, I can answer the first part of the question. I can't answer the second. I have no idea why I went that route other than it felt right. But like, uh, what, what's the saying? There's only 12 notes a person can play. It's just sort of how you play them. And I think this was a movie that, yeah, like it, it had a pretty uh, straightforward melody. And so the fun was sort of finding ways to, to do something different with those sort of very sort of uh, well-established elements. And I don't know. I think uh, we just all, I think everybody who worked on the movie, uh, Josh, Sarah, uh, the rest of the cast and the rest of the crew, I think everybody just wanted to get wild. It seemed that way. It seemed like everybody who joined the project was joining with this intention of like doing something a little different than what they normally uh, have the opportunity to do. Um, or maybe that's just what I, I was seeing in people's faces. I don't know if they were feeling that, but it, it seemed that way to me. No, trust me, it definitely came across that way when I was watching it, um, you know, especially when you get into the second half of the film. I was just constantly going, where is this going to go from here? You know, what is this about? What's that about? But I absolutely love that aspect of things. You know, that's what really uh, drew my attention to it. Um, so I suppose for yourself, uh, Josh and Sarah, you know, what was... Um, you know, you're handed this widely imagined to script. You know, what are your initial impressions when you first read it? I mean, I just loved it. I, I, I was like, I think everything Travis just described was really evident in the script. I thought Meredith was really interesting and smart and not sort of the like babe in the woods being led to slaughter, whether she escapes or not, but sort of, you know, sticking around for good reason and then getting caught for good reason and uh and then all those surreal images were so vivid and exciting in the script that it was just it was just wildly appealing yeah it's just so wholly imaginative i mean it's uh I keep saying this but <clears throat> the, the, the easiest way to describe the movie is patrick bateman and the evil dead cabin you know it's uh essentially getting an, his ass kicked by the, the feminist furies. It's, it's, um, it, it couldn't get more appealing um, just as an artist. And also just knowing that it, it's, it's a wonderful vehicle as an artist to kind of take swings. And that's what it was for all of us. I mean, Sarah and I play, you know, multiple characters, all the furies do, you know, and that, that was so, uh, so exciting to be part of. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you took those big swings because it just enhanced the experience. Um, so sort of uh, with yourself, Travis, I want to talk about the look of the film. So I'm assuming this was shot in film. Yeah, right. yeah, it was. Yeah. Uh, so apart from the fact that, you know, shooting on film always, for me anyway, looks better than shooting digital. What was your main driving motivation for shooting, uh, you know, a wounded fawn in film? 
Well, the way I described it to the department heads was, uh, don't think of this as a horror movie. Think of it as a fashion film where the, the sort of details in what you're doing, whether it's the production design or the wardrobe or the hair or the makeup or the lighting, uh, is going to be striking. The, the aesthetics are going to sort of drive the, 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 the sort of movie. Um, and so the film was just one aspect of that. It's like, we, I wanted this to be uh, a movie that we get inside both characters' heads. And so the way they perceive the world uh, is going to be exaggerated. So therefore the look of the world has to be a little exaggerated. Um, and then it just all sort of lined up like that. I am so sorry. <laughs> that, was, that was so loud in my head. Oh, you no. guys heard that, right? I'm not crazy. No. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, you look this, really this little crazy. voice. <laughs> no, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Should I talk? Should I stop talking? Uh, anyways, so yeah, I think uh, the aesthetics were like sort of a, uh, another character of the film right from, from the get-go. So we have, we have Bruce, we have Meredith, uh, we have Kate, and we have the, the aesthetic of the film. And, oh, that's great. Uh, and um, yeah, sir, just to touch on your character, Meredith, again, you know, when we first meet her, she's in a very vulnerable place. She's just come out of an abusive relationship and, you know, she's, you know, met Bruce and she's fallen for his charms. Um, how did you approach, you know, playing a role, you know, with that kind of arc where you start in a vulnerable position and then you undergo, you know, a literal transformation on screen and uh, end up in a position of strength? You know, how did you approach playing that? Um. Well, I think I kind of saw it as starting from a position of strength where she had kind of healed a lot from that previous relationship and um, was able to come back around to like uh, not just being vulnerable emotionally or like in terms of being available to someone else or to life, but like recognizing that she's vulnerable is is a strength you know like you then suddenly the um the blinders have fallen from your eyes you know those like rosy lenses are gone and so she's going into this like pretty sober and grounded and um and of course gets caught anyway but i really liked that she was starting from a from a strong place um i like that like they're not in love this isn't a love this in no reality was this gonna be a love story you know like it's a date <laughs> you know she's like going to get laid this weekend and have some fun and start going back into the world and I thought that was also a really strong choice um and it also kind of echoes uh because there's there isn't like a relationship or like a romance at stake in this and so that's also like working in her favor there are less um less like attachments for her and then playing uh to Tiffany, like there are no stakes. She wins. She knows she wins. You can't touch her. She knows it. She knows she's right. And I and I, that was just really like very clear. And uh it was a nice feeling just to be playing a character where there's like there's no noise in the head. It's just like you're wrong. You're bad. Admit it. The end. It was like very satisfying. And I think where a a person would hope to get to in or at the end of a, a bad relationship yeah well that, that's why i think the audience really roots for sarah as a character it's just that yeah. you know dimension and element to her but uh then looking at your character then josh um you know it's a very you know how did you approach playing you know such a dark character you know did you sort of research do any sort of research in real life serial killers or did you just base everything purely on the page everything was pretty on the page rather than doing any kind of research i you know i always kind of found that like uh the more sort of matter of factly and grounded you can sort of play it the sort of scarier and then you know part two of the film speaks for itself but um for me it, it was all about the kind of acting challenge of just playing uh <clears throat> as natural and as kind of grounded as possible which is something i don't often get to do or do especially with my background in comedy playing so many goblins and you know women in prosthetics um, so uh, I, I was thrilled to kind of play into like, you know, what what's uh, seduction look like or playing seduction, playing sensual, grounded, you know, staying in my voice and 
whatever, feeling my my feet rooted in the floor as opposed to, you know, taking like big sketchy swings. And that was that was super fun. And then I think all of the, you know, wild swinging artistry I typically would apply to comedy stuff over the years or just kind of being like, you know, a wackadoo. Uh, that was all id for, you know, part two of the film. And just that that just felt even more comfortable for me to, you know, yell and scream and run and ramble. Yeah. Well, that, that, well, they do say that, you know, horror and comedy are very, you know, closely matched together in terms of, you know, how audiences react to them and that there. And it certainly sort of comes true in your performance as well. But um, sort of on the note of, you know, researching that in and around the film, you know, we have this sort of motif and character of the Red Isle. You know, whenever you were sort of writing that and coming up with that, Travis, was that sort of... Um, sort of based on you know the idea of you know you hear stories of serial killers hearing voices in their heads like famously David Berkowitz believed his dog told him to kill people and stuff like that is that sort of the same logic you went with you know in it determining um that Bruce should kill someone at a certain time or where did that idea sort of spring from yeah um Sorry, uh, there, there's an answer, and I'm just being like, what would David Lynch do? Would he answer this? <laughs> would he, would he show oh, his cards? That's <laughs> but, uh, where he just goes, no. <laughs> when somebody, yeah, exactly. Like, Mark Kermode like, asking by electricity in his films, and he just goes, no. <laughs> yeah. Well, you want if if you don't want to talk about, it, that's perfectly fine. I was just find it very interesting, you know. No, no, I, I, I'm no David Lynch, so I'll answer. Um, the, uh, but yeah, I think, I think, you know, whether or not in reality those serial killers have heard the voices i think certainly in the in the context of of uh narrative for bruce this is a person who can't accept uh, accountability or responsibility for his own actions so for him to have manifested a other it's not me it's this other character who is doing these things uh allows him to maintain his sense of self. Um, so I don't even, in my interpretation, I don't even think he actually hears voices. I think he just kind of has created this as an excuse. Like it wasn't me, it was, it was you know, my invisible best friend uh, who did these terrible things. Um, and then there's this other aspect of the, the, the movie sort of, is drawing on and referencing uh, the surrealist art movement and uh, the painter Max Ernst had this uh, symbolic representation of himself called Lollop. Uh, that was a giant red owl, so. All oh, right, I see. No, no. That's... So it all seemed, it seemed to be a, 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 a way to uh, achieve both with the same character. Yeah. Um. So sort of a question for yourself, Justin, sir, again, you know, on, in one of the initial scenes with the two of you together, you're um, on the car journey to this cabin. So I was just wondering, you know, in the dialogue that you have with each other, you'll just find out uh, information about each other and getting to know each other. Was any of that sort of improvised or was it based purely on the script? Because it felt very natural and it came across as very natural, this, you know, for who the characters were. It was all scripted. Yeah, this, this there was sort of I don't want to say there was no room for improv. There, there you know there was Sarah and I were I feel like consistently playing, um, which was the great thing about doing multiple takes. And you're doing on you know in film you can't really improvise because every every inch is uh, is another ten dollars. Um, but uh, but I think the repetition of playing those scenes um, when we were able to just kind of made it feel naturalistic and also just like having a partner like Sarah was, you know, it, it makes it very easy. We're really listening to each other. So um, it's a wonderful yeah, and that, moment. And that was one of the, the scenes that we had a chance to really sort of, uh, when Josh came to, came to the production before we started shooting, that was a scene that we all had a chance to sort of sit in a room and they got in chairs and pretended they were in a car and, I think it was really useful for us to sort of, because that scene is sort of setting the groundwork for what the relationship is and where it's going to go and, and and all of that, like to watch you guys sort of go through that process of figuring out those beats and how much connection uh, Meredith is comfortable with, when does Bruce sort of step over her comfort line, all that stuff, like 
I think by the time we, even by the time we got to shoot it, you guys had done some really great work sort of getting in rhythm with each other, um, which, you know, as an outsider, you know, to watch was really cool. Yeah. An outsider. As a third <laughs> you know, I was an outsider too, too Travis, and I, you know, I really appreciated it, which is why I thought I'd bring it up because, uh, you know, I really enjoyed that scene and, you know, the way you guys performed, it was just fantastic. Um, but yeah, and I suppose then, um, you know, we've sort of went over the idea of art uh, within the film and the role it plays. Um, you know, the relationship between Bruce and Meredith is sort of just initially sprung upon the fact that they both admire, you know, uh, art. And, you know, whenever you were approaching it, uh, Travis, for me, it sort of came across the idea of like, um, he, you know, Bruce was tapping into, you know, Bruce is sorry, predatory nature was sort of tapping into the fact that he knew Sarah liked art and he was sort of drawn in by that there. You know, uh, did you have this sort of idea in your head, you know, in terms of the natural world, in terms of using something, you know, that's beautiful as a form of attraction yeah. to lure in prey? Is that something that came into mind whenever you were drawing up these characters? Yeah, I mean, that, that's so, that's such a great observation because, it, yeah, that was it. Like, it was like, how does this, how does, in re, what reality does Bruce operate? And how is he successfully able to operate in that reality? And so that idea of this, this sort of uh, art world, this sort of surface sort of come in and out, come into these auctions and then leave town. And I was like, oh, that seems like a way for a predator to be able to sort of move through an environment. And the, the way I think of Bruce is, I don't even know if he really has a deep emotional connection to artwork but he does like how it makes him seem to others. Like he likes the references, he likes having that stuff around because he thinks it pr projects an image of himself that he likes, it makes him look more attractive, it makes him look uh, more sophisticated. Um, and so, yeah, it was definitely part of his sort of uh, weapon or, t or tool or device to use to, to sort of uh, get his victims to let down their guards. So yeah, I think he, he specifically does sort of target the the people who would be uh, uh, attracted to and sort of like, um, uh, yeah, whatever the word, let their guards down because they're like, oh my gosh, look at this great, sophisticated, interesting human being. Exactly. Like you get that idea with Meredith's character when she shows up at the cabin, she sees all the artwork and she's just enthralled by it. You know, it definitely comes across and... Um... Just another thing I want to touch upon quickly, just within the realm of art, that song LSD, where did the idea of you know including that come from? Because it's just a great song, and thank you for introducing me to it just through this film. Uh Manfred Man, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh yeah. Uh you know, there is a hallucinatory aspect of this film. And so having a song that uh, literally says that seemed uh, another sort of layer to add to it and aesthetically sort of fits the whole vibe of the movie that we're going for, which is this kind of 1970s sort of, uh, you know, exaggerated, not swingers vibe, but, you know, like a, 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 where the where the surface qualities of a thing are very uh, important. Yeah. Well, that's what I mean. It works very, very well anytime it does play a trait the film. But uh, just to touch on the second half of the film for the likes of yourself, Sarah and Josh, um, how did you handle, you know, it's it's a really physical, you know, thing, uh, perform sorry, you both have to deliver, deliver, sorry, very physical performances. And you're doing it during a night shoot. It's, uh, you know, you're under heavy layers of makeup and all sorts, and you're dealing with, you know, wild animals and snakes and that there. You know, how, how did you guys approach that and how did you handle it, essentially? Well, Josh talked about um, his challenge being um, just keeping it really grounded. And I feel like that's always my challenge, like getting out of my head and being grounded. And frequently the more physical um the performance is or the the scene is or whatever the easier it is for for me to just sort of connect simply so i actually thought it was a real relief like 
it, you end up drumming up this natural energy because you're running um, and you uh, speak louder because there's a mask in front of your face or whatever. So it kind of, it, it just really helps. So I, I felt like um, the physicality, especially during the, the many, many long days of night shoots, um, that it just energized me. I don't know about Josh. Yeah, I, <clears throat> same for me. I mean, it was just it's just a joy to do. I, I was talking about this the other day in an interview. People, some there was a makeup artist who at four in the morning was just like bowled over by how I had any energy, and I was like, well, maybe it was, part of it was might have been like the diet I put myself on, not eating anything I, I like. Um, but it was also just because it was such a joy to do to be physical. I mean, you know, you get to play the in my instance, the kind of the the killer, the villain, and we both have these these um, the appealing aspects to like playing the fun role. We both get to we both get to sort of do that. Um, and again, all the all the Furies really got to do that, uh, playing these you know multiple characters and showing off the spectrum of what we can do. So it just was such a such a joy. Yeah, yeah, and like I say, it was a joy to watch. Um, you know, especially that second half. Um, and sort of just one sort of closing question. It's for all of you. And I'm trying to be careful of how I word it because it involves that final scene. You know, where did the idea to have that sort of tableau come from? And how did you guys approach just literally just standing doing that performance in one long continuous take? I we've been asked this question before, and I don't know if it's just I feel like I'm getting further and further from being able to answer it because now I'm like, where did the idea come from? But I think it came. Oh, Sarah knows. I know that there is uh, an inspiration shot in a movie we watched once. Oh, really? Okay, what movie? Electric Glide in Blue. Oh my God, you're fucking right. The, was, oh yeah, 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 yeah. It's a huge inspiration. There, there's like a yeah. Yeah. But electric gliding blue. Elect Electra glide like E L E. Oh. ETRA, oh. which is a phenomenal movie it's with a phenomenal. great last shot. <laughs> yeah. It down. yeah. Um, but so we had, so we were shooting film. And so there's 11 minutes per film canister. And as I think it was during, I think that was the second to last night of the shoot or the last night of one week of the shoot it was like towards the end and at the beginning of that week i think we sort of knew this big scene was coming up and the idea of like hey what if we just ran an entire roll of film on this and not as not to challenge josh and sarah but to be like can we do this like a, like a fun challenge not like prove your ability actors <laughs> but uh and so you know like they said, like, yes, they were energized uh, while doing these night shoots, but there's also a component of like delirium and exhaustion and it was raining and it was like, it was really tough. And so emotionally, when we got to this point of like, hey, we're just gonna do this once. We're gonna run the entire film and let's see what happens. Like that was like, that felt like um, like artistic, uh, like a trapeze act where we're just gonna go for it. We're gonna see, we're, we're, we're in rhythm, we trust each other. We're at the end of the shoot, we're all friends. We're like making stuff together. Like we're, we're like a band that's been on tour for a long time and now we're just gonna jam. And watching these two uh, just do it was like probably the highlight of, of, of my filmmaking career so far because it was simple and pure and true just these two people so i i love that <laughs> i love you guys for doing it so thanks and uh yeah i really appreciate it that like it's you know it really is a lasting image that does stick in your head long um after the film's ended um so i think just sort of wrap up things there uh just to remind everyone, A Wounded Fawn is on Shutter from the 1st of December. Please check it out. It's the perfect night to watch it and all when it's released. It's out on a Friday night. So sit with a bunch of friends and watch it. It's fantastic. And it's probably one of my favorite horror films of the year as well. And uh, I just want to take the opportunity again to thank you all so much for taking uh, the time to speak to me this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us, man.
It's a pleasure. Yeah. All right. Enjoy your night. All right. Until next time. Bye, Ned. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. See you later. <laughs> I have plans this weekend. The mystery. Yes. Mystery man. What's right. right? What mystery man? I brought that record I was telling you about. Oh, great. To art and beauty. And the night ahead. Have you ever experienced anything weird here before? forward to our time here together.